All right. So welcome everyone again. My name is Jennifer Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of NASW New Jersey. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today for the conversation, Queer and Black Politics, um, Identities and Movement. That was a lot to remember. So I'm sorry, I'm looking down a little bit. Um, this is an important conversation and we are so grateful to have Bianca here with us today to talk and lead this conversation. Uh, Bianca is an experienced educator and a professor at Monmouth University and a certified health education specialist. And we are just so excited that you're here. Um, a little housekeeping before I turn it over to you. So folks on the line, you'll know um, if you've joined us in previous conversations that the chat box is open and available and we really want this to be a community conversation. So we encourage you to chat in the chat box um, and also raise your hand if you'd like to contribute to the conversation and I'll come on and I'll call on you and also be able to unmute you so that you can uh, contribute and ask questions. If you have something that you'd like to comment on privately or just want me to share anonymously, you can message me directly in the chat box below and I will either ask your question anonymously or share your comment anonymously as well. Um, we are just getting a couple more people let in and um, so I am at this point going to turn it over to Bianca. I'm so grateful that you're here for us. Thank you so much. Um, I know you've got a couple of slides to share so I'll whatever you'd like to do I'm, I'm turning it over to you. All right. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I am so excited to be here everyone. Thank you so much. So I I had originally said that I would not show presentation slides but as an educator that is extremely difficult to do because I want to give you all the visuals. I think the visuals are so, so important to actually understanding what's happening for the black LGBTQ community right now. So I would do want to acknowledge that it is Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. Uh, usually we would not be in this virtual setting, but you know, this is our first time having a virtual pride, an online pride. So that that is in its history books <laughs> just for that reason alone. But normally we would be uh, in, a, in a physical space. And so uh, GSC, about my organization, we're just an LGBTQ organization. We do a lot of legislative work as well as education as well. But I want to just jump right into the meat of it because when I talk about the Black queer community, I have to start and I have to acknowledge history. Part of the reason why the Black LGBTQ community is struggling right now is because people do not know the history of the LGBTQ community. So I'm going to walk you through it. So the first part is, you know, starting off talking about the flags. I think it's super important that people recognize that this was actually the first LGBTQ flag that the community used. So as you can see, it has a Black background symbolizing death and the pink is actually an upside down triangle that they used in Nazi Germany because many people are not aware that being Jewish was only one of the reasons why you could find yourself in a concentration camp. But your sexuality, homosexuality, was also a reason for you to be imprisoned in these concentration camps. So pink demonstrates the sexuality piece of it, right? And so what most people don't know is the, the LGBTQ flag actually has all of these colors. This is the original flag. It had pink on there to symbolize sexuality. But unfortunately, it basically got taken off because once the flag started to become popular, people were basically manufacturing companies didn't have enough hot pink fabric. So basically the pink got taken off of that. But you might've seen recently that the flag has changed a number of times to be more inclusive. So as you can see here, this is the first incidence of the black and brown stripe. And that was brought up by Amber Hikes, who is a black queer woman that was the coordinator of the, L the Office of LGBTQ Affairs in Philadelphia. And so when these two stripes were added to the LGBTQ flag, the community was actually really upset. There were a lot of people that said that I don't want the black and brown flag on this, on our LGBTQ flag. Why are you making everything about race? Why is it so important to have the flag specifically on the LGBTQ flag? Being LGBTQ is not a matter of race. But the reason why those two stripes were added is because the black and brown community or people of color 
felt that inside of the LGBTQ community, there was a lot of racism. The same way that they decided to add the white, baby pink, and baby blue uh, colors to the flag in addition to black and brown stripes to represent the trans community because even within the lgbtq community trans people and uh people of different races so whether they're latinx whether they're black etc have found that they're not being treated right within the lgbtq community and so most people are aware about stonewall right? Because it's been 50 years since the Stonewall riots, but they aren't aware of who actually started the riots for the entire community. And that was led by Black transgender women. And you know what? When they actually decided to try and make the Stonewall riots into a movie, they made the main character a white gay man instead of the Black trans women that actually initiated the entire riots against police brutality, right? So when we're thinking about the state of this country right now and what happened 50 years ago or 50, yeah, 50 years ago for Stonewall, the exact reason is the same. People are rioting specifically about police brutality. The police have a horrible history with the community, uh, especially since, the, you know, over time, it's become legal to be an LGBTQ person. But in the 1950s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 60s, it was actually illegal to be an LGBTQ person and out in public in places like bars. So these bars that people celebrate at now were actually places that were hidden. People used to go to each other's houses if they were LGBTQ people because there was literally nowhere else to go. And it should be noted that when it comes to the movement the political movement for the LGBT community, there is a lot that can be lost here, especially if you are a person of color, because you're already experiencing all of these things because of your one identity, your race, and now you're experiencing it again with your sexual orientation or your gender identity. So that loss of uh, family and friends, the estrangement from your faith community, harassment by law enforcement, right? All of these things are pretty much happening. All of these things people are feeling, uh, people are feeling discriminated against, especially in, t in the past, the workplace was one of the main issues for the community. And so when it comes to black LGBTQ people, you're actually less likely to learn about black LGBTQ people because their sexual orientation or their gender identity comes second to their race. So many people are familiar with Martin Luther King, but they're not familiar with Bayard Rustin, who single-handedly organized the March on Washington. But when he was organizing the March on Washington, these leaders literally told Bayard, hey, we want you to take a step back from the limelight because we don't want your sexual orientation to be aligned with Dr. Martin Luther King. Imagine the headlines, right? Dr. Martin Luther King, gay man, hangs out with Bayard Rustin, even though it wasn't even true but people were threatening the entire civil rights movement because of Bayard's sexual orientation because he didn't hide it. So when it comes to being, having multiple identities, often black queer people have to put their blackness first and then their queerness second. And we see that reflected, uh, we're talking about different kinds of black people, black queer people. So Marsha P. Johnson, very outspoken advocate, very well known for initiating the Stonewall riots, but what most people don't know is once Pride actually started to become a celebratory event, white gay organizers actually banned Marsha from coming to Pride because she was advocating for black trans issues. Imagine advocating for the LGBTQ community and then being told that you can't come to Pride anymore because you're talking too much about trans people because at the time they wanted to focus solely on gay men. But we see here all over the place that there is an erasure of black people, black queerness. So people are familiar with Harvey Milk. They're familiar with Ellen. They're familiar with Christine Jorgensen. But not a lot of people know about Sakia Guns. 
she was a, a black lesbian woman or girl, excuse me, she was killed in Newark, New Jersey for being a butch lesbian that turned down the advances of a man. Do people know about Erica Hart, a non-binary black femme that does exemplary work talking about the black queer space? No, these, na these voices, these names are not uh, contributed to the larger conversation. And one of the main problems is people actually don't know how many black LGBTQ people there are because again, the census, the, the, the federal government doesn't have a lot of uh, demographic questions that would capture this community. And then there are lots of barriers specifically for black LGBTQ people racism that people feel, whether they're in the community or out of the community, uh, classism, ableism, all the isms that you can ever imagine. And it's so much so that there's a divide in the LGBTQ community between black and white. And you see that in different areas. You see that uh, when it comes to being accepted, black LGBTQ people are less likely to be accepted. But then you also see that our culture, Black queer culture, is more likely to be in the forefront. So if you've watched the movie or the show Pose, you've seen the ballroom scene, or if you've watched Paris is Burning, which is a fabulous real life documentary of the Black ballroom scene. The Black queer community has always had to fend for itself because when Black queer kids were getting kicked out, they actually didn't have a place to go. So they created this ballroom culture because of what was happening in the world. But then the ballroom culture started to become racist and keep Black people from participating in something that they actually created. And not only in that, but in the spiritual community, unfortunately, you're more likely to be accepted in your religious affiliation if it's a white religious affiliation. As you can see here, uh, Black affiliated religious organizations are actually less likely to accept you if you are an LGBTQ person. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there as well. In education, black queer kids are more likely to slip through the cracks because of their unsafe or under-resourced schools. You know, the school to prison pipeline affects black queer youth. And then talking about the hiring piece, again, not only is it your sexual orientation or your gender identity, but it's your race. So we just learned recently that there's, uh, there's laws in place to protect everyone federally because of their LGBTQ status, but there's still, we know there's still discrimination in hiring black people in this country. And even in the community itself, there's plenty of microaggressions that happen. So I have a picture here and you'll find this, uh, that 90% of black LGBTQ people have faced racial discrimination. That's huge, that's a lot of people. You can see here that this is a, a rainbow picture. So people will use the flag in the background, but say no Asians, no blacks, no fat people, no Hispanics, right? This is the community saying, we don't want black queer people in our conversations. We don't want black queer people in our events, right? We see here up, up, up at the top, this is off of Grindr, which is a, a, an app that people use. It says, oh, don't bother responding to this if you're Black or Asian. Open racism that people can per talk about what kind of people they prefer. And then we also have to t talk about what's happening in, with the Black trans women community. If you look at this chart, they are majority the ones that are getting murdered. Look at the rates here. 80% of black of transgender women that are murdered in this country, 80% of them are black. That's huge. Victims of homicide for black, for anti-LGBTQ victims of homicide, that's 56%. So when we're talking about LGBTQ issues, we have to talk about black issues because black people, black queer people are the ones that end up being the victim, right? When we're talking about Trans black trans lives matter. The reason why there was a distinction is because black trans people have the life expectancy of 35, 35 years old. That is so young. When we're looking at transgender day of remembrance, majority of these people on this list are black trans women. And I think it should be noted here that even though we have uh, 
we received a federal law that covers people for employment, all the states that are read here in this map, you can still be discriminated against for housing. You could still be discriminated against for public accommodation because of your sexual orientation and gender identity. So yes, we have employment, which is fantastic. However, if you are a person that's trying to seek housing, you can still be discriminated against. That civil rights act that happened in the 60s does not cover your sexual orientation or your gender identity. So specifically, talking about what's happening now, and this is where I'm gonna uh, chime in with you, talking about like what's happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement. This movement was created back when I was an undergrad. This, 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 org this movement has been around for more than 10 years. And something that I find very interesting is when this whole thing initially started, and let me, let me close my screen so it'll be more of a conversation. When this whole thing originally started, black, saying Black Lives Matter was a statement that many people felt was very aggressive. At when, when you said Black Lives Matter when, when, I was, when it first got created, that was the equivalent of being associated with like a new version of the Black Panther Party. You did not find corporations, funders, uh, governing agencies saying Black Lives Matter. No one had said that before in the past. And so we have to think about the evolution of Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was created by Black queer women to address the fact that there is a lot of experiences that the Black community as a whole is experiencing, regardless of if you are uh, LGBTQ, if you are middle or upper class, if you are educated or not. That movement was for all Black people, regardless of who you are. They were keeping in mind that the Black queer community was still being discriminated against. And so when that movement created, unfortunately, a lot of people latched onto it specifically for Black men. It was like Black men took the priority where everyone else, every other Black kind of Black person kind of got pushed down. And so we have to examine how did, has that happened? How did the Black queerness or even the Black womanness of the Black Lives Matter movement completely get pushed down and deprioritized specifically only for Black men's names to be recognized. In fact, in addition to the Black Lives Matter movement, the hashtag say her name was created because if a Black man died, majority of America knew about it. If a Black woman died, America as a country did not know about it. And so the say her name movement came in addition to the Black Lives Matter movement simply because Black women were dying as well but it wasn't being talked about, whether it was their victims of violence, victims of police brutality, victims of the healthcare system, this conversation of what's happening to black women completely disappeared. And, and one could argue that, you know, it's, it, it contributes to the, oh, black women are strong narrative, right? That you could pretty much go through anything as a black woman and be okay because you are a black strong woman. And so we have to raise we have to raise a lot of arguments about that because I definitely think that that's not that strongness is taking away the humanity of Black women, and then we also have to talk about what's happening to Black trans women, because majority of them are experiencing violence from cisgender Black men. So within the LGBTQ community, we have to encourage. Black cisgender men, that it's okay to be with a Black trans woman, that we shouldn't shame them for being with a Black trans woman, because that shame could contribute to some of the violence that has happened specifically against Black trans women, because you don't see white trans men, women getting killed the same way that Black trans women are. Literally two days ago, a Black trans woman was murdered, 17 years old not even able to live out her life, 17, young, a baby, right? Like not even an adult in our eyes, but it happens so often. And so that's why if you've noticed recently that a lot of people 
are moving from Black Lives Matter to all Black Lives Matter. Because now you have the Black Lives Matter movement pushing against and saying, yeah, Black Lives Matter, but like not the LGBTQ Black people. Like don't, I think the issue is when you are a minority community, people tell you to push some of your identity away so you don't conflate the larger issues. Oh, don't talk about your sexuality when we're trying to fight for civil rights, right? That's what happened in the 50s and 60s. Don't talk about your sexual orientation, Bayard Rustin, because we need to focus on race with Dr. Martin Luther King, right? Prime example. Oh, don't talk about, don't talk about your gender identity right now because it's hard enough being a Black person in America. But we can't piece apart or prioritize all of our identities, right? If, you, if someone said, put your identities in order, which identity is more important to you, being a woman, being Black, being Caribbean, being, being Nigerian, put it in order. Which one's more important to you? It might be difficult. Some people cannot do that. So to piece apart someone's Blackness and someone's queer identity and tell them that they have to prioritize them is a very disrespectful thing to do because we have to acknowledge that the entire person matters. And so, Jen, I don't know if you want to uh, tag in at any time. Let me know. I could educate forever. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. A lot of people, the introduction was really informative and you brought up things that I certainly was not aware of. So I really appreciate a little bit of the history lesson and how uh, that frames the conversation today. I do have one question. I'm just sure. curious on your thoughts, you know, what feels like the terminology we should be using. Should we be saying all Black Lives Matter now? Is that the direction that we should be headed? Yes, simply because there are Black people that will not advocate for Black LGBTQ people, even though the entire Black Lives Matter movement was started by Black queer women. Some people will go out of their way to fight against that and say like, oh, like I, I was on Twitter the other day and someone said, you know, you can be gay, but your Blackness should come first. We shouldn't pick that apart. And that's why I think saying all Black Lives Matters because it doesn't just mean, oh, your life matters if you are a Black cisgender man or a black heterosexual woman. The experiences of the community, regardless of your sexual orientation or gender identity, are very similar. We are experiencing violence in this country. Violence overall, violence from uh, the legal system, the criminal justice system, from, from, from everywhere, from the police. And it's centralized around the idea of white supremacy. A lot, of, a lot of the community don't think of the LGBTQ community, even though if you go back to your culture, anybody's culture, you can find Black LGBTQ people there. There were Black trans people in different parts of Africa. There were Black gay people in different parts of the Caribbean. But you know, when we think about the, the colonization, the Christian crusaders of the past, the, you know, the different religions coming in and saying, you're not going to worship this, you're going to worship this, and LGBTQ people got pushed aside. Like one of, the re one of the questions I get all the time is, how come I can't find a lot of literature about Black LGBTQ people? Because it was destroyed. Like our history was destroyed so that if you can't see yourself reflected, of course your community gets pushed down within the Black community because there's more there's more literary texts about cisgender heterosexual black people than black LGBTQ people. And that's why I think the distinction is it has to be all black lives matter and not just certain black lives matter. The same way that everyone knows about, um, about uh, Eric Gardner or Tamir Rice, that's, they should also be knowing about Tony McDade, a black trans man that was killed. Brayla Stone, that, she was the black 17 year old trans girl that got killed recently. They should, everyone should know everyone's name and they don't. You're more likely to be able to tell me a black man that was killed in this country than a black LGBTQ person in this country. And that's why I said like, you have to say all oh, black lives matter simply because of that kind of narrative that we have. 
I appreciate that. I think that's really important for us as we start, you know, and we continue to have the conversation around Black Lives Matter to make sure that we're using verbiage that feels inclusive and represents what we're really trying to say and transitioning to the all, li all Black Lives Matter as something that we'll take to heart as a organization. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering if there's anyone here who has thoughts, wants to comment or weigh in before we move on. This is a good breaking, a, a moment of pause. No, all right. Well, I'm gonna con let you continue to chat with us and let us be educated by you. And um, I'll jump in with a couple of questions in a few minutes. Okay. All right, so I guess I should talk about, I wanna go more into, let me, let me go back to my slides. I wanna go more into the topic of your, like the concept of being intersectional. So let me go That back. would be great. So most people are familiar with the term of intersectionality now. Uh, this term was coined specifically to talk about the racial wage gap, right? We know in this country that for every dollar a white man makes, depending on your race and gender, you move further away from that dollar. And so when it was created, it was specifically to address that, but it's a sociological theory that talks about multiple threads of discrimination, when you have multiple identities that overlap, overlap, excuse me, and those identities are in the minority section. That's what we have to pay more attention to. And so when it comes to doing any kind of programmatic services, my first question is, is your programming, is your practice, is the way you approach things intersectional? Because if they're not, then I think the main thing that you're going to have to do is start changing and looking into that so that you can be more helpful to people. Because let's say, let's say a patient shows up to your an emergency room and you as a social worker, you say to that patient, okay, tell me about your story. Tell me how I can help you. You need to know every piece of that person's identity because it's going to play into a part as to like what you can do for that person, right? Let's say you get a trans person and they say, I need help finding housing. Well, now you have to be up to speed with what's happening for housing for transgender people. Because it's one thing to place a cisgender person into a housing facility, right? That's not a big issue. But if someone's trans, and they come up to you, now you have to say, okay, I have to think about this person being a trans person going into a facility. That's what I mean by having like these, these, uh, these ideas of making sure that you are identifying someone's complete identity. And so someone's complete identity, it should be, before you even work with someone, you should be able to identify in your own mind how this works. So let me, let me show you here. So when you're working with identities, these are, there's different kinds of identities in this world. Your social identities, these are the big nine, right? So most people are aware of them. Your race, class, your ability, your physical ability or mental ability, your race, religion, and then your other social identities. So that could be what you look like, where you are geographically, the languages that you speak, your academic stuff. So when it comes to identifying ourselves, we have to first view how we view our own intersectional identities, right? Because for some people, and I, I love this example, this is a concentric circle. So if you had to take three identities for yourself, the outer identity is the identity that you think about the very least, right? So for me, I think about me being a part of the LGBTQ community the least. And I can say this because I work at a queer organization 
I live in a state that has laws that protect me from being fired or denied housing or denied public accommodation. I can count on one hand the amount of times that I've been discriminated against for my sexual orientation. So for me, I don't think about it that, that often. Then you have your middle identity that you think about occasionally. So for me, I think about class. I'm a middle class person, which I, and I think about this more often than my sexual orientation because I am a black woman. So I know about the racial, the racial uh, gap when it comes to my paycheck. I know about uh, the class of the black community and how important it is for me to be able to give back to my community. I think about, uh, you know, I think about the way in which my career will go as a black woman. So to me, that piece is my middle piece. But my center identity, my center identity is my race. Because everywhere I go, I am reminded that I am black. Whether it's the fact that I am the only black programming person in my organization. When I used to work at the hospital, I was the youngest and the only black person that worked in that department. I live in a county where there are not a lot of people that look like me. I was born in Summit, New Jersey. And if you're all familiar with Summit, it's not that racially diverse. Even in high school, I was very, very aware of my race. So for me, my, my most, uh, the identity I think about most of the time is my race, not my sexual orientation. But when you're working with a client, their identities, their concentric circles are going to be different than your concentric circles. But if you ask me, Bianca, like, oh, what's more important, your sexuality or your race? I'm going to say they're both equally important. I can't take away the fact that I'm Black or I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. They're both something that I care about very deeply. It's just that one of these things I think about all the time because of where I am in my life. And your concentric circles can change. They're, they are going to change. And I, I encourage you all to do that exercise on your own. And if you want any other categories, you can use this here because we, we all are very uh, vast people that have different kind of backgrounds. And so something that I think is unique to the Black LGBTQ community is the idea of minority stress which is stress from being in different categories, different social categories, being stigmatized because of your minority identity. So not only are you being stigmatized or victimized because of your LGBTQ status, but now it's also your race as well. You're feeling both of these things at the same time. And for me, because I am a woman, now we're adding something else on there. I am stigmatized because of my race, because of my sexual orientation, because the fact that I am a woman. So now I have three things that I feel minority stress from. And this stress is created by the outside community. And so often I think when it comes to the LGBTQ community as a whole, there is a lot of oppressive behavior from the people that hold the most privilege within the community. And those people are going to be white, cisgender, affluent gay men and lesbian women. Because when you think about it, think about pride. When you look at the celebrations, majority of the people that attend those celebrations are white, cisgender, affluent gay men and lesbian women. When you look at certain areas across the United States, you ever notice that there is a pride and then there's a black pride? There's a reason for the distinction because even if you are in the LGBTQ community, it does not make you exempt from being racist. And I think a lot of people don't know that because they'll say, oh, I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. I know what it's like to be discriminated against. Sure, you know what it's like to be discriminated against because of your sexual orientation or your gender identity. But what you don't understand is how you can be discriminated against for your race in addition to your sexual orientation and your gender identity. When we're thinking about these uh, LGBTQ organizations, right? Even though we're one big happy family and community, majority of these LGBTQ organizations, their employees, their board, their leadership are white, affluent, cisgender, gay men and lesbian women. So whose voice isn't at the table? People that are bisexual, people that are trans, people of color. 
deliberately and exclusively left out. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about history, there was a time in which if you, there were white gay bars that only let in white gay men. So if you weren't a white gay man, you could not go into that bar. They would kick out black gay men, Latinx gay men, black trans people from being in those bars. The same way there were lesbian bars that would only let in white lesbian women. So like even historically, there's so much racism within the community that we have to have the black and brown stripe in there because if not, we're not talking about what's going on in our own community. And I, I tell people all the time, the LGBTQ community has a lot of work to do internally. Just the way that we treat each other is a real disservice. Like you're, we're so often familiar with, um, with gay and lesbian people or celebrities if they're white, right? When, when we're talking about, uh, let's, let's use Caitlyn Jenner, right? We all know who Caitlyn Jenner is. It's very hard to escape the Kardashian clan, right? So we all know who Caitlyn Jenner is, but why was she asked to voice her experience about the trans community? She is a rich, she's richer than everyone on this entire <laughs> Zoom call, okay? All of Indeed. our salaries combined would not even touch what she makes a week, okay? They asked a white, affluent, cisgender, trans woman to talk about her experience as a trans woman in America. Why would you do that, right? Like she is very affluent. She does not have to engage in any kind of sex work. She's not being denied housing or put in a prison with, a, with the wrong gender, right? That's not gonna happen to Caitlyn. That's never gonna happen to Caitlyn. But somehow she has found herself in the limelight as a spokesperson for trans people. Regardless of what's actually happening to trans people on the ground, she is somehow the exalted trans expert right? When we're talking about equality, the average transgender person makes less than $30,000 a year. That's not something that Caitlin can even imagine what that's like, right? So when we're talking about being inclusive and looking at a person, you have to also put in people's identities because I know uh, white transgender people that make more than me as a black queer woman, because of their racial identity. So like not paying attention to someone's race in addition to their LGBTQ status, heartbreaking. You have to pay attention to that because a white gay man will go so much further than me, a black queer woman, with my fiance, who's also a black queer woman. Their salary will go so much further because at the end of the day, they still have the most privilege than everybody else. They still have privilege over my fiance and I that are two women and two black women at that. So every dollar that that white gay man makes, we're making about 60 cents to that dollar collectively together. That's why I'm like, we have to talk about that. And I see in the comments here, yeah, there were a lot of bars that were segregated. And even when I was younger here in New Jersey, there was an LGBTQ bar um, in Sayreville and they would play different music to attract different crowds of people. So the top level would be your, your techno punk fu funk Lady Gaga style. But then in the basement that was significantly smaller, that's where they would play the Latinx music. That's where they play the hip hop music on two completely different levels. So you had white affluent gay men and lesbian women on one floor and everybody else on the other floor. Wow. It's, it's crazy. And you, you, you have gay, lesbian, bisexual, cisgender people openly saying, I don't like the trans community. They shouldn't be a part of our community at all. Against their own community members. Because at the end of the day, you being cisgender is still having more privilege than someone that's trans. That life expectancy of 35 doesn't oh, apply God. to you if you're a cisgender person. So it's like, the community has to do a lot of work too. It's even when I do my LGBTQ trainings, if I did my LGBTQ trainings and included race, it would be so much longer than an hour, right? When we're talking right. about <laughs> the different ways people can identify themselves and their healthcare outcomes, right? When we, when we look at HIV, 
we know that HIV affects the LGBTQ community, but if you look at the racial disparities of the Black community, Black LGBTQ community versus the white LGBTQ community, the Black LGBTQ community, the, the rates are comparable to the early 90s, the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. That hasn't gone down. So yes, it is about race. It has to be about race. You have got to include it in your practice and your thinking and everything that you do, because if you don't, you're going to con continue to only bring in one kind of person. And what I found with my research in New Jersey is that being a part of a marginalized community makes you feel so isolated that general services that are pliable for everyone, they don't think it applies to them. I've had to go to places and say, this specifically is for you. You can come here to this healthcare center. It is for you. Because they're like, I don't know if I could go there, Bianca. I don't know if it's safe for me. Right? Mm. I see a question about specific issues in healthcare for Black LGBTQ people. Mental health is huge. Mental health is huge for the Black LGBTQ community. We can definitely do a better job talking about mental health issues, mm -hmm. access to care, barriers, and research, even in LGBTQ research. Majority of the subset population that are surveyed are white, right? I did, I did my own study in here in New Jersey, and majority of the people that completed the survey are white. So how do I, as a person, get accurate uh, data around what's happening for all kinds of LGBTQ people if I'm only, my survey's only getting white, affluent, gay men and lesbian women, right? So mental health, that's a big thing. HIV is a big thing here in New Jersey. Making curious. sure that we, go ahead. I'm also curious about just how that really, how this also connects with COVID, right? Because I'm sure that there, Oh. <laughs> as if there wasn't just one global pandemic happening. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm sure it affects transgendered individuals and just the care that they receive in a really significant way. So majority of LGBTQ people actually work in either the healthcare industry, the food service industry, or academia, all of which have been <laughs> impacted by COVID right now. So basically the service industry, a lot of LGBTQ people are not employed right now. And you know what the most dangerous thing is? For some people with their employment, there goes their health insurance, right? LGBTQ people are more likely to be underinsured or uninsured completely. And I'm sure you all know, if you don't have health insurance, it is very hard to get certain services done for yourself because they end up costing a lot of money. And when it comes to COVID, LGBTQ people are more likely at risk because LGBTQ people are more likely to smoke. LGBTQ people are more likely to smoke and use substances more than any population group. And I know I, I'm switching hats because I... I I teach at Monmouth and my class is substance use. Anytime I talk about substance use, I, I switch over to another part of my brain because if we're looking at this, you have corporations like Big Tobacco that will go to LGBTQ organizations and say, especially during this time when LGBTQ organizations are not actually receiving a lot of funding and donation from their sponsors or from funders and say, I will give you $500,000 if you allow me to pass out dollar coupon cigarettes at Pride. And it's been done. I have gone to Pride and received coupons for cigarettes. I can go to Pride and receive little shot glasses of some big alcohol company because they specifically prey on the LGBTQ community. And so your increased smoking puts you at risk because now you're damaging your lungs and you're damaging your cells. So now that puts you at more risk for COVID because you're more likely to smoke. And looking at the, the bar culture in the LGBTQ community, one of the reasons why the bar is so prominent is because that was literally the only place you could go to find other LGBTQ people. You went to the bar because there was nothing else for you. That was the safe. 
right. That was the space. That was the space for you. Like think, think very, think now, like what LGBTQ space are you familiar with? That's not in a bar. Probably a community center, but that's pretty much it. I see here in the comments. Yeah. ATL pride yeah. has beer companies giving away freebies, right? Literally these companies will come and pray on people that have been discriminated against, experienced prejudice, uh, experience loss of family and friends like and this is a vulnerable community and then you have like these big corporations coming and saying I will give you money if you let me show up and pass out these things and, and so the organizations need the funding to do the they, need the funding. they need the funding to do the work to keep their lights on to pay for that community center to offer more programs for the community but it almost makes you question like what kind of message is it that if you have to depend on outside funding from these corporations that are more likely to take advantage of you, it makes you question like, where can you get your money from? Mm -hmm. And for the community, it's really limited right now. Like right now, people are not giving to LGBTQ organizations in the same capacity that they used to. Because right now the priority is COVID, COVID. Everything is COVID related. And so I see Joseph asked the question, are there pending policies or laws you should be aware and advocate for? Yes, there is a law that we are working on federally called the Equality Act. So basically it takes the Civil Rights Act that only covers race, national origin, uh, sex, which at the time was only male and female, and it would basically make it a federal law that prohibits being discriminated against for your sexual orientation and gender identity for housing, public accommodation, business credits, et cetera. Because right now, the only law that exists for the LGBTQ community federally is that employment law. And mm -hmm. it took until 2020 for that to happen. You know, so, so often I think the misconception is, oh, gay people, they wanted to get married, they wanted to get married, they wanted to get married, so that when marriage was equality done. happened, oh, we're done, that's it. That's the only thing that needed to happen. And what most people don't know is, marriage equality was not the primary issue for the LGBTQ community in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. It was never the primary issue. The primary issue was employment, housing, and healthcare. But somehow LGBTQ marriage equality got to the top of the list and that's what passed first. Like you can get married, sure, but I, let's say I can get married and before this law passed, go to another state, put my picture of my wedding on the desk and get fired for it. How did marriage equality take, take the top spot when you could still be denied health care, depending on what state you're in? You can be denied housing. If my fiance and I wanted to move to another state, they could literally say, we don't want this kind of family in that neighborhood. But somehow that got lost in the, you can get married now. Hooray. And that's not me knocking marriage equality. I'm, I just got engaged to, I'm very happy that I can get married. However, now I have to consider what state are we going to live in? Because I could lose all my precious rights that I have here in New Jersey just by going the next state over. And we're also trying to work on mandating that every place that offers direct services collects information around SOGI data. So asking questions around your sexual orientation and gender identity. And we're asking this because if I don't know how many LGBTQ people uh, need help in New Jersey, how do I apply to the state for funding, for, for research, for programming, for outreach and activities? The same way we have information around race, we have to have information around sexual orientation and gender identity. Like we are the most, especially in New Jersey, we are the most densely populated state in this country I have to have accurate numbers so I know how to help people best. If I, I know anecdotally around New Jersey that LGBTQ people are still getting discriminated against, that they need help, that they need more likely to need services referred to them, but that information doesn't exist anywhere except through people telling me because people are not collecting SOGI data. You have to collect SOGI data because if you don't, the numbers of LGBTQ people that actually need help are always going to be lower than the actual reality. Right. Anecdotal information doesn't drive policy and it doesn't speak to funders in the same way. And it doesn't tell the story of 
the health disparities and all of the needs of the community. Right. We have to have that concrete data. That is the only way to move things forward because then we can pass more laws because we'll be able to see the actual healthcare disparities that exist here. Yeah. I think that's so important, particularly for the social workers on the call today and even the macro social workers and the researchers or the policy program coordinators in your agencies to make sure that you're pushing for that information to be collected and you're asking those questions within your own institutions um, so that we can continue to you know, collect data and do so in an organized and meaningful way. Absolutely. I think that's something that you know, you all can take back to your agency and say like, hey, this is really important. We have got to ask this question. And not only that, that majority of the healthcare systems in New Jersey have Epic now. And one of the main things that Epic does is it has those questions already. So just learning to implement them for your own agency is something to look at. And if you're interested in that, definitely contact me because I will walk you through step-by-step step how to ask these questions. <laughs> I have like a whole presentation that's like step by step. This is how you collect this information and this is what you do with it. That's fantastic. There's actually a question that came in from um, Facebook that I wanted to get um, back to um, earlier in the conversation um, when we were talking about the prioritization of identities. And do you think that that was done to appease the dominant culture and make the movement of Black Lives Matter more palatable? Whew. Okay, ask the question one more time. I just wanna make sure I'm, before I answer yeah. it fully. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, just do you think that the, um, or at least some of the prioritization of identities was done to appease the dominant culture and make the Black Lives Matter movement more palatable? So the exclusion of the LGBTQIA and trans community, if that yeah. community was included, would it make BLM more, more uh, controversial. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, like if we're, if we're looking at the movement, one of the reasons why the movement wasn't as palatable in the past is because it was associated with specifically, I mean, if you're, I have conflicting feelings. I feel like- You're allowed, it's complicated. <laughs> it is, it's a complicated thing. Because even within the Black community, there's not enough conversation around sexuality, the actual conversation of human sexuality. Like forget LGBTQ, I'm talking about basic sexuality, attraction, safe sex practices, even that conversation, there's still a discrepancy in the Black community. There's still uh, more higher healthcare disparities for the black community around HIV and STIs. So like that, that whole sexuality piece, that's something that has to be addressed as a whole. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to dismiss all the black LGBTQ people that have been vocal over these past couple years, openly critiquing the movement saying, you need to incorporate us because we started this, this whole thing. But I do think that by having the all Black Lives Matter piece, now it's doing a better job of pulling in different populations of people that weren't necessarily looking at Black Lives Matter before the distinction of including LGBTQ people in the, in the actual movement piece. Great. We have, I appreciate that somebody is messaging us on Facebook to say, yes, thank you for your thoughts on that. So appreciate it. We just have a couple of minutes left um, before we wrap up and I'm a great timekeeper. And although I could listen to you speak about this forever and I've already learned so much as everyone else is indicating in the chat box, I wanna be mindful of our time today. Um, are there other sort of final concluding thoughts that you have for us, things, action steps that we can do Absolutely. Um, take away from today's conversation and uh, not to worry everyone on, on the Zoom call today, We're, we'll be, uh, finding you again for more conversation. Absolutely. That's clear. <laughs> so I, I think the first thing you can do is you have to elevate the Black LGBTQ identity narratives. I think so often that, you know, people focus on, oh, we want an LGBTQ person, but they'll take any LGBTQ person. Like, no, be specific and elevate certain voices. So during Black History Month, guess who you could elevate? Black LGBTQ people right? 
incorporate them as well because like that is a part of blackness uh specifically looking for resources for black lgbtq people because there's a reason why black lgbtq people might not seek services just from lgbtq organizations you have to talk about both identity pieces you know definitely I encourage everyone to learn more about implicit and explicit bias and how it can, how you can adapt your practices to actively dismantle systems of oppression. And I'm talking about all systems of oppression, right? Sexism, racism, homophobia, like the entire idea of white supremacy working to dismantle that. And then looking at specifically policy that affects black lgbtq people because just because it helps affluent gay people or affluent lgbtq people doesn't mean that it affects all community members or the most privileged community members right and i think it's important that when we think about funding we think about donation we think about finances everyone's so quick to help large organizations like hrc but what about all the small black owned LGBTQ organizations? They don't receive the same funding, the same sponsorships, the same, et cetera, as HRC or any large entity, right? So instead of giving your money towards a, like a larger project, why don't you go and find a local black or Latinx owned LGBTQ organization and give them your money? Because they need the same help that all the larger entities do. That shouldn't be your only funding source. Everyone's so quick to you know, think about GLAD or GLSEN or the Trevor Project. And don't get me wrong, they need help too. But there are black LGBTQ organizations that will equally accept your funding as well. Diversify where your dollars go. So you can give to, uh, thinking off the top of my head, the Audre Lorde Project. There's the Brooklyn Boyhood Society, uh, the National Center for Black Equity, um, the Brown Boy Project, just look up Black-led LGBTQ organizations and give them your support, give them your dollars, uh, refer people to them, offer your services as a social worker to them because they need it the same way that these other organizations do. They just don't have the resources that the larger entities do. Yeah, thank you so much. Welcome. I think that's a really great place for us to end today's conversation. I know that we all have a couple of action steps on our to-do list, I've written a few down as well. Um, I just wanna thank you all for being with us today. These conversations are really important as we continue to um, move our organization and just advance the work in our community. So I am grateful for everyone's participation in your feedback, but um, specifically you, Bianca, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. I uh, just share, everyone has loved this presentation, both in the Zoom chat today and also on our Facebook. and. I hope you will come back and join us again. Of course. Because we have a lot to learn from you. You can contact me at any time. I'm looking forward to the next time that we come in contact with each other. I hope you all have a great weekend. If you need me, Jen, you can pass my email to everyone. I could talk forever. Contact me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous. I know there are a couple of people, Monique, uh, nodding your head. Yes, that they wanted your contact information. So we'll make sure that we follow up. Okay. And for those of you who want to share today's presentation, it will be alive um, on Facebook immediately after this and then available at naswnj.org uh, tomorrow so that you can share with your friends, your colleagues, your loved ones, anybody who needs to hear this conversation. All right. Thank, Thank you, you all so much. Bye. Bye.